Georg Hendrik von Richter Philosophy Conference. Today are the National Finnish Philosophy Portal Philosophia.fi and the Philosophy Department at Obo Academy University. Philosophia.fi is produced by the philosophical magazine Niin Janain uh, and Europalaisen Philosophian Seura in cooperation with the Philosophy Department at Obo Academy University in Turku, Finland. My name is Yrsa Neumann, and I'm one of the editors of the National Philosophy Portal, philosophia.fi, as well as of the, this collection of Georg Henrik von Richt's text. I'm especially honored that Elisabeth von Richt and Georg Henrik's wife and their daughter, Anita von Richt Grönberg, are here today. It's thanks to von Richt's family granting philosophia.fi the permission to make these texts available that the collection could, collection could come to be at all. Tommi Palosari and Sonia Vanto and Erik Halstenson and Barbu Nordling have done the heavy work with these texts. And Risto Wilko has assisted Lars Hatzberg in the selection of texts for publication. Thank you all for that. Um, and thank you also to the publishers of journal articles and books who have given us the permission to publish their editions, and to all the institutions who have given us financial support. Now, this may sound like a pathology, but this is a recording. Um, the web broadcast here is made possible by Dan Holm at the Obo Academy Computer Center and Pekka Tenhonen from the Audio Video Center. We also today celebrate the release of Frederick Southland's anthology, Philosophical Probing's Essays on von Richt's Later Philosophy. And themes from this book guides the discussion which we are here to listen to. And, hap and I'm happy to present to you two of von Richt's friends and colleagues, Frederick Southland, and, who is a permanent visiting professor at Uppsala University and a professor in philosophy from St. Olaf College in Minnesota. Um, and Lars Hertzberg, who is the professor in philosophy from Obo Academy University. First of all, I'd like to thank Irsa Neumann uh, for taking the initiative of uh, having this public collection on the portal and doing all the hard work. Um, and I'm talking to Frederick Stoutland, who, as we heard, is professor uh, emeritus of philosophy at St. Olaf College at Northland, Minnesota. Fred has recently edited a collection of essays by and about George Henry Combrick called Philosophical Probings, Essays on Combrick's Later Work. The publisher of the book is Automatic Press in Copenhagen. First of all, uh, Fred, could, could you tell me a little bit about your relation to Combrick? How did you come to have an interest in his work, and what does it mean to you? I came to know Fonrik when I was a, became a Fulbright Fellow in uh, Helsinki uh, over 40 years ago. I had uh, heard about Fonrik. I knew also about uh, Jaco Hintika and Eric Stenius, who were also the, the three persons who were internationally known. And it turned out that uh, of all of the countries that uh, I looked at for Fulbright, Finland was the only one that listed philosophy as a, its own distinctive field. So I applied, um, not knowing any of these people, and was accepted and came here with my family and settled in. And uh, Von Rick had been gone for several months uh, in, in uh, South America, and he returned in November. And, and called me up and asked whether we could meet. And as it turned out, we met and had weekly discussions after that. We had uh, found each other uh, congenial. And uh, so that's how I knew him, was through these uh, weekly discussions. One feature of this, I, I might like to say, uh, I applied for a Fulbright. I had taught for nine years without a sabbatical. I hadn't gotten much done. But I had gone to a summer conference and had met Elizabeth Anscombe. And I asked her with some trepidation whether she would write a letter for me uh, in this application. And I'm sure that uh, 
the reason I got the Fulbright was precisely because of this letter uh, from Anscom. So there is this connection that I've had for a long time with these uh, two philosophers whom uh, we think of as uh, related in various kinds of ways. Yeah. Now what I, what I got from Sundrich was uh, simply a, a, how to talk about philosophy just as philosophy. Uh, we didn't read anything. We didn't talk about anybody in particular. He didn't give me any of his stuff. We just talked for two hours uh, every week. And this was an extraordinarily challenging and stimulating experience for me as, as a young and quite inexperienced philosopher. And so that began uh, my friendship. And since then, I, I have I had contacts with him uh, sporadically, uh, sometimes often, sometimes only after long years. But I continued work in, in philosophy of action, which is what I had applied for as a Fulbright. And his work has remained a kind of anchor for me. I mean, certain things that he said. I remember him saying, for example, I don't know how action is related to reason, really. but." I do know the relation is not a causal relation. And I accepted that and have taken it as a kind of, uh, it's taken me a long time to understand exactly what it meant. But it helped me to resist the kind of uh, tide of persons for whom this was a kind of mantra. And um, so, I mean, that, in a sense, that's the sort of central relationship I've had with uh, Sir Henry. Yeah. Actually, that was the time when you came here in 68. That's when we met, too. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's now uh, 40 years 41, ago. 41, yeah. 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 Mm. Speaking about uh, von Richt uh, and his personality, I think it's striking that on the cover, uh, on the cover of the book, there's a view of the ocean so shore, and there's a line from Melville's Moby Dick. And the line goes, all deep, earnest thinking is but the intrepid effort of the soul to keep the open independence of her sea. Uh, this line was used by uh, von Richt himself as an epigraph uh, for his intellectual autobiography in the Schilt volume on his philosophy. Now, I think the choice of this epigraph really is very well in keeping with the, something that strikes me as a, as a distinctive feature of Henrik's intellectual persona. He's mm. a very individualistic thinker. Um, you might recall here that another individualist, Wittgenstein, said, the philosopher is not a member of any community of ideas. That's what makes him into a philosopher. And that, uh, I think that would have suited from Rick very well, too. Uh, so, in a sense, from Rick is obviously an offshoot uh, of the logical empiricist tree in philosophy. At the same time, in his critical work, he hardly mentions any contemporary philosophers, logical empiricists, empiricists or others, whether people he agrees with or, or disagrees with. And the same is true of his relation to Wittgenstein. He says uh, on several occasions that he has learned a great deal from Wittgenstein, but never makes that explicit in his work. In one sense, uh, in the preface of In the Shadow of Descartes, he writes, if in what I have written in later years there are echoes of out outside sources, they stem, stem mainly from Wittgenstein. But this influence from Wittgenstein is not really noticeable on the surface, at least. And I think this is connected with his open attitude to various philosophical traditions. It's also striking that when von Richter has written about contemporary philosophy, which he's done several times, he's written overviews of, of the different movements in today's philosophy, that they are totally impartial. I, I, I can't think of anybody else who would be able to do that, to present 
uh, all the, the main directions in velocity today without taking a stand or, 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 or showing which one of those he agrees with. Um, so uh, that, that's a peculiar feature of him, that, that he, uh, he has this ability to stay uh, unbiased in relation to different ways of doing philosophy. But I'd like to ask you, Fred, how, how you see his relation to mainstream analytic philosophy on the one hand and to the philosophy of Wittgenstein on the other hand. Would it, could you describe him, if that's possible, as a one-man tradition? Well, that, that would mean whether he'd established a tradition, and I, I'm not sure that, that when one would say that. It's perhaps too early to say. But he surely was an independent thinker. He was a very tolerant person. I mean, I think that's why you, you, you talk about his impartiality. Um, he, he was able to see what was good and worthwhile in, in, in all of these traditions, even traditions where he was himself highly critical. He, he could see things that were worth uh, taking note of. I mean, for example, one of the things he did for so many years was to run a seminar at the University of Helsinki, a weekly seminar in which speakers of all different kinds would come in. And he would always ask the first question, and, and no matter how sometimes the papers were silly or, or really bad, he always found something of worth to ask uh, about the paper. And, uh, which would then lead to a good discussion, even when things seem to be quite unpromising. Um, but, but he surely, this epigram, I think, surely fit what he did. Um, he read a lot. I mean, when I, when I had my discussions with him, I didn't think he read because there was no references to people. And, and it was a, a few months after that that explanation and understanding came out. And that was the themes of that book that we were talking about, which has an enormous bibliography. It makes it clear that his reading was extensive and, and, and thorough. Um, so although in his writing he seldom mentions other people, for example, his latest work, um, In the Shadow of Descartes, there are hardly any references to current work. And yet it's, it's clear that he knows all that stuff. He just doesn't find it useful to talk about it. He would often tell me that, uh, he, he would say, reading is a problem for me. Which didn't mean he didn't read, but it did mean he didn't quite know how to deal with all the stuff he read in relation to his own work. So he would tend to read and read and read, and then when he was working on his work, he would put all that aside and, and not read again, simply because he did not want to be uh, influenced in ways that he didn't want to be by the people he was reading. And surely in that sense, he's like Wittgenstein, who also, well, it's not clear that Wittgenstein did read a lot of philosophers. He certainly didn't make references to them. And I, I do think that uh, he began as an analytical philosopher. He began, as he has, has said, in a sense, a kind of a wholehearted believer in the kind of philosophical optimism that that particular movement embodied, the idea that with sufficient, hard, cooperative work, the problems of philosophy could be resolved uh, once and, and for all, uh, that uh, the reason things hung on was because there wasn't sufficient exactitude or not sufficient care and so on. And and, uh, but I think he gave that up fairly soon. And perhaps he's never a wholehearted believer in that because, after all, he knew Wittgenstein at a very early age uh, in his career. And there's no question but that Wittgenstein's way of working, and what I would say is Wittgenstein's genuine philosophical interest in him, he's always wanting to deal not with a program, but with the philosophical problems that really concern us. This was always his, his view. I mean, even when he did his formal stuff, what really interested him 
were the philosophical issues that were behind uh, all this. So that um, he remained an analytical philosopher in the sense that he tended to use some of the methodology. He liked the kind of terminology that was there. He certainly knew all of the analytical philosophers and conversed with them. But I think that uh, Wittgenstein remained the philosopher who was most important for his work. And he, he, he also said that he couldn't, Wittgenstein was not his way. I mean, he had to take his own way. Uh, and that he didn't, at one point he said he didn't think he was good enough to do it Wittgenstein's way. And he would also say, but that just didn't fit what he was trying to do. So he was, uh, um, he learned from Wittgenstein, did what Wittgenstein thought should be done without being a, a, a Wittgensteinian in, in any sense. And uh, presumably this was precisely, of course, what Wittgenstein wanted. Wittgenstein did not want disciples or acolytes. Mm. And von Rickert seems to me did about as well as one could do for being faithful to the spirit of Wittgenstein without sort of being an acolyte or a copy. Mm. You know? Okay. Uh, I guess what one thing that they had in common was a, this conviction that philosophy and science are clearly distinct activities. And, uh, I think that's mm. true. I'm, I'm not sure what to say about that with respect to his early work because uh, certainly he was brought up as a, as a logical positivist, and I suppose Kylo was a kind of positivist. And, and it was typical of that school to think that there had to be a very close relationship yes. between them. Yeah. Although, because some of the positivists also made a very sharp distinction between science and philosophy, or a kind of um, analogous distinction between fact and value. And that remained for, Vic, for Von Rick an important distinction all along. So I, I, you're certainly right that um, he had an enormous respect for science and he knew an awful lot about science, but uh, he did not think that philosophy should construct theories that were in any way like uh, scientific theories. He, he thought that one had to recognize that the kinds of problems and issues that were dealt with were, were very different. Hmm. I remember the one of the first books I read was uh, from Rick's textbook about logical empiricism, which he wrote in, when he was about 27 or something, and uh, uh, I thought that was very inspiring. I mean, it made me sort of think that logical empiricism was quite exciting. Yeah, yeah. Well, he uh, he he talks about how he he caught the spirit of, of this, and yeah. which he later became somewhat disillusioned about. Yeah, much better than Ayer's language, truth, and logic, uh -huh. for instance. That way. But did you get the impression from reading the book that here he was committed to, let's say, the, the positivist ideal of exactitude as what philosophy should do? That was the feeling I got, yes. Uh -huh. yeah. I think he gave that up. Yeah, this was very early, I mean, yeah. 1943. So, yeah. Yeah. It's funny, too, to think that he was only 23 when he met Wittgenstein the first time. So he was quite young. That's right, yeah. Um, there's another aspect to this individualism I'd like to talk about. Um, you, talk, you talked about uh, not wanting to have acolytes, and, uh, uh, and it's true from Rick too. Uh, he had a b great number of good friends. I think he was unusual in, in, in the number of friends he had in philosophy. But he didn't really have close students in the sense of somebody who either follows closely what you're doing or studies what you've been doing. I mean, you, you, you're one of the few who've been studying his philosophy closely. Another type of student, of course, is Jakob Hintikta, who is prominent in his way. But on the whole, I mean, there's no sort of Tom Rick school of philosophers. And uh, you'd be inclined to say that he inspired a great uh, number of young philosophers because he would always take an interest in what people were doing, but, uh, but he didn't shape them very much. Or didn't try to, and that seems to be analogous with his own relation to his teachers, Kyle and Wittgenstein. That he he wanted to keep a kind of distance from them, 
and he encouraged his students to keep distance from him. Do you have any thoughts on that score? I mean, how would you characterize his influence as a teacher? I don't, you know, he taught for about 10 years, I think, as professor of, in, uh, in Helsinki. And I really don't know very much about what those years were like and, and uh, what, I, kind, I of I, I and what kind of a teacher he would have, would have been. He, he, he finished teaching just when I started. Yeah. So I, I, I can't tell you really. But I, I mean, I think of him as a kind of teacher to the world. I mean, he traveled, he conducted seminars. There were any number of philosophers for whom he was very, very important. So that his his uh, teaching, I guess you'd say, was m directed not so much at at new young people, but more at at, at mature philosophers. Mm. Uh, and he certainly played an important and many-sided role at that point. I mean, his when he became a member of the academy, of course, he had no teaching duties, but it's not fair to say that he ceased to be a, a teacher in a sure. sense. Yeah. That, uh, he nurtured and encouraged and corrected and, and, and for an enormous number of, of people. And, and he went on running the seminar. Which and seminar? The, the, the seminar, well, that's, that's true. I mean, one mustn't forget that. That was, I think, important for many people for many, many years. Yeah. And it, made the, it really made the department in Helsinki. Yeah, right. It's interesting when you compare him with Eric Stenius, who, who, who wasn't so uh, outgoing in many ways, but he had more uh, personal students. I mean, yeah. In this room. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, well, I knew him yeah. too. Uh, you know, yeah. I, and uh, he, he was the person I liked and could also talk to. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I thought that uh, from its relation to, to logical empiricism could be described as that of a cautious rebel or polite rebel. <clears throat> he was critical but his voice was rather subdued, and he hardly ever criticized other thinkers by name, which again is quite unusual in philosophy. One aspect of his relation to logical empiricism was his ambivalent attitude to the idea of rationality. On the one hand, he seemed to have a strong belief in the power of human thought to clarify the conditions of human existence, but on the other hand, he thought rational thinking was responsible for some of the worst problems of our contemporary world. Was this a product of the different impulses that had shaped his thinking, for instance, Spengler on the one hand and the Vienna Circle, the logical empiricist on the other hand? How would you understand his attitude here? Was there, was there a central unclarity here in his thinking? I, I don't know what to say to this, I guess. I, I'm not sure I'd call it on, on clarity. Um, but he read Spengler fairly early on, I think, and, and, and always had this kind of pessimistic attitude toward uh, what you might call world historical events in one sort or another. And whenever, I mean, I remember him in conversation saying things about things that, for example, the fall of the Soviet Union and... Uh, seemed like a hopeful thing, and he always worried about what the bad effects of this would be. And there was this kind of pessimistic uh, undertone. I mean, as a person, he was always optimistic. You know, he, at least I always thought of him as a cheerful kind of person. And philosophically, too, he was kind of an optimist. I mean, I think he expected the best from, from philosophy. But he combined it with this... Uh, world historical uh, pessimism, which he thought had something connection to philosophy. I mean, Wittgenstein was a bit the same way. He, he could have a, there was a kind of dark side to his way of, he'd talk about the darkness of our times and so on. But, but I guess I'm never quite clear exactly how these two things, uh, how these two things go together. Yeah. Um, do you think there's an intellectual uh, inconsistency? I, I guess I, I wouldn't. I don't know. But yeah. uh, I mean, I mean, it's, uh, Tim Williamson in his thing on logic talked about uh, how um, logic went on in the '30s when things weren't very good. 
in the continent, and that this was a kind of counterexample to uh, Funrick's point. Well, I, I'm not sure that uh, maybe that's a little silly, but there's something to that, you know, mm. in a way. So I don't know quite how to fit this together. I mean, you know, he did keep this distinction between, as you talk, as you, you know, between his philosophical work and his more humanistic, spiritual sort of thing. Now, I mean, I think, I don't think that he ever thought these were unrelated. What he did think was that the kind of um, standards for really good philosophy were different from the kind of standards for really good writings about more humanistic matters. Yeah. In fact, he was even inclined to think that there were, the standards were less rigorous and so on. And, 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 and he therefore thought these were sort of two things that he did. Yeah. Um, and maybe that means that in some sense rationality had a certain kind of different meaning for these two areas. Right. Yeah. I guess I don't. I don't think I have a good answer to, no, I, I, to this interesting question. Yeah, no, probably is hard to answer because I mean he doesn't uh, seem to note that maybe there are two really different notions of rationality here, and that may not have very much to do with. I mean, I do know that uh, some people, you know, talk about diagnosis of our times and thinking Funrich involved in that. I, I, I do think that a lot of the times he would talk about uh, what was what was going to happen and so on and he was he was sort of wrong on that I mean I think he sometimes got uh, his historical projections wrong mm. which is perfectly understandable in a sense but uh, because these are not philosophically based uh, claims in any case sure yeah you know. Do you think he tended to to believe that certain nations were more? He was more optimistic about certain nations than the last. Yeah. Uh, well, I remember. I remember one point he said to me that well, you know, the only ethnic uh, dislocation that we have in Europe now is in the Tyrol, in Italy. Mm. But this, of course, was before all this stuff in Serbia and everything uh, went on. When uh, we're now engulfed in this yeah. kind of ethnic dislocation. Right. Yeah. I mean, in a sense, he was right, but he was afraid of the chaos that came <laughs> after the Soviet yeah. Union. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we, we already mentioned this, uh, these two sides of his writing. I mean, there's, um, the, as everybody knows, he had two, two different careers, one, one in, clearly in academic philosophy and the other one uh, as a public thinker, writing about issues in the culture in his own times. The first he did in English, the latter in Swedish, mainly. Um, but there was also a development on both sides. On the on the academic side, he started being very interested in theoretical philosophy, probability, induction, modal logic, tense logic, and so on. And then he turned towards practical philosophy, philosophy of action, ethics, free will, um, and uh, on. In his public writings, also there was maybe a, a development from this more individualistic, aesthetic reflection on the history of Western culture uh, to more uh, political, critical writings about about uh, contemporary problems, peace, and, and uh, the environment, and so on. Um, uh, and, and you said that he kept a fairly strict line between these, but, but uh, they were not separated in his own mind or life. Uh, do you see any kind of in interdependence between these two developments? Yeah, it's, it means in a way the question we were talking about before. He, he, he said that he turned to practical philosophy in the first instance because he had to teach it. I mean, he was a professor of practical philosophy for a while. That's a practical reason. So uh, he was required to teach ethics, and therefore he got interested in, in uh, these practical matters. And uh, and it was then he published uh, Variety for Goodness and Norm in Action about the same time that he was engaged, or shortly, yeah, I think this came out shortly after he stopped teaching. But those were the products yeah. of his having to deal with 
ethical issues because he was required to, to teach them. And that, I think, also then, I mean, he talks about these various stages in his own, uh, what should one say, his own spiritual meaning, uh, mode or something like that, from being a, a sort of an aesthetic individualist romantic. This is what he was as a young person. The Spangler goes along with that. And then he became an ethical individualist, I think. And that was because of his teaching of ethics. But then he developed what he called a kind of social humanism. And for him, this was uh, triggered by his reaction to the Vietnam War. This, it was at this time that I knew him as well. And then that was his uh, eloquent protests against the Vietnam War were extremely important for my own way of thinking. But also for him, when he, he began to see that one had to deal not simply with individuals, but with uh, nations and societies. And, and so he, th then he became interested in these larger social political issues that led him to his uh, in interest in environmental issues and anti-nuclear and, and, and so on. Um, and certainly his philosophy reflected that in the sense that he became interested in uh, in hermeneutic philosophy, he, he, he came to know the, some of the dissident philosophers of East Europe, and that became important for his work. And he just turned to new issues and new readings, and uh, in, in a way, uh, he perhaps never gave up his interest in, in formal matters, but they became less important, I think, for his overall work. Of course, that's very generally, I mean, very political times. Yeah. Well, that's true. And he, and he shared that and, and participated. And there's no question but that his contributions to public discourse were, I think, extraordinarily good. I mean, extremely well written. And that the, the kind of um, popularity he enjoyed was, was wonderful in, in a sense. I mean, he wasn't that of a demagogue or anything. It was no. well-deserved. Mm -hmm. He got well-deserved attention for the sorts of things that he articulated. Was that because somebody in his position said those things? Because others would have said them too. But well, I don't know how he. I mean, it's not diff It's not easy for philosophers to become public intellectuals. Mm -hmm. I guess mm -hmm. so. That not, not nowadays. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but he used whatever status he had to to to, to good effect. I mean, he was the kind of person who would, who never, ever gave a kind of second-rate performance. When mm. He always worked, I mean, I, you know, he was going to read a paper to a small group of philosophers. He would practice it mm. before giving it, and it's sort of mm. typical of the way he, yeah. he worked. Right. Yes. <clears throat> yes. I remember hearing that when he was chancellor at Oba Academy, and I knew the one who was his secretary, who told me that he, he went through every bit, bit of business very meticulously. Yeah. And, uh, did all the work himself, you know, uh, so a very conscientious man. Um, uh, Fonica said that the work he most enjoyed writing was The Varieties of Goodness, and uh, I think in a way it's also my favorite among his books. I mean, I enjoy reading it, but uh, there are things in it I, I find a bit problematic. Something that many people like, which I don't really have no, what to deal with is uh, his idea that when we reflect on value concepts, uh, we are not simply noting what the concepts are like, but we are giving them shape, since the concepts are often all open or indeterminate, leaving room for disagreement about their application. He says that uh, there may be cases in which the grounds for applying some word, quote, have not been fixed, when there's no settled opinion as, as to what the grounds are, end of quote. And he said, says that in such a case, the concept needs to be molded and its logical connections with other concepts established. And he goes on, quote, uh, the use, uh, the words, the use of which bewilder the philosopher are, so to speak, in search of a meaning, end of quote. Uh, in giving the concept shape, he adds, uh, or giving the concept shape may be a way of trying to direct human lives 
Um, now this I find a bit hard to understand. I mean, how could a philosopher, you know, tell us, well, you, you should uh, treat your concepts that way and you accordingly live that way. I mean, what is the authority, what could the authority of the philosopher be in this connection? And it isn't the fact that uh, many of these concepts are open to disagreement a reflection of the fact that people actually disagree in life? I mean, you can't, uh, can you re remove the space for disagreement by deciding that things should be this way or that way? Um, what do you think about that? Well, I'm not, I guess I don't worry about the disagreement thing. I, I mean, uh, you're, you're not going to, by any of the, you know, attain, attain agreement. But it does seem to me that the notion of molding a concept is not, it's a good idea. I, I mean, you, I mean, take, take the concepts that are difficult to avoid when you're talking about moral matters, I mean, justice or duty or, or virtue or, or whatever, and, and they certainly are thrown around in pretty loose ways in our discussion. And I, it doesn't, and, and, and the appeal to what we say, it seems to me, isn't going to get us very far. And, and, and that's a point at which I would, I don't, I think, uh, Anthem and he both agreed that, uh, in, in some sense, we can't just say oh, that's what we would say. So that in some sense, one, but at the same time, one can't simply make proposals about what these terms mean. There has to be some middle ground between, uh, you know, stipulating on the one hand and simply trying to articulate what people say. And, and that's, I think, to me, what he was what he was looking for. Um, and that perhaps the degree to which we get some sensible notion about how justice relates to duty, relates to compassion, r relates to benevolence, and so on, to the degree to which we get some clarity about how these terms might interrelate, perhaps it would help something. Right. In terms of how we should live our yeah. life and, and so on. So, but so maybe there's a distinction between between uh, trying to get people to be more clear about how they actually use words themselves. Uh, well, to they, make yeah. distinctions, for instance. I mean, that's fair enough because if what people say about how they use words yeah. may not be at all helpful. No. Yeah. Uh, and, and certainly that's one way of looking but, at yeah. it. Right. But the other. It would be that somehow you sort of you change things and then you leave something different behind. I mean, uh, as if you could. Well, if you think about this, I mean, just think about a Socratic dialogue. I suppose. I mean, you know, take the euthyphro in which you attempt to get clear about what it is to be pious and, and uh, the sorts of things that people say. You know, just a few questions show that uh, that, that it's going to work. You don't really mean that. Yeah. And that what you try to achieve at the end might well be trying to mold the concept of piety in such a way that it becomes uh, one that we can use in a, yeah. in, a, in, a, in a helpful way. But in that case, you are always trying to bring the clarity out to the other person. I mean, you're not imposing your own notion, I think, uh, that... Um, Unless the other guy is ready to see things in a new way, so yeah, that's no use doing yeah. it. But I'm not sure that what the, the quotes that you give would rule that out as a, as a way of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, people have always wondered: does, Did Socrates really have his theory about piety that he was just trying to push over on people? Mm. Yeah. Well, presumably, mm. presumably he didn't, and I would have mm. thought that. Well, some, sometimes something. he comes across as if he did have theories, <laughs> but, you know, right. but the idea there seems to be that, or oh, he says himself, that <coughs> there's no point in, in, in my telling you this if you don't see it yourself. And right. Sort of thing, you know. I, I, I always thought Socrates, at least at the beginning of the dialogue, sincerely thought he could learn something from these guys he talked to. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Unfortunately, it didn't take him too long to find out there wasn't much to be learned. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think that's quite typical of philosophy. We, we profess not to have any, uh, anything to to teach people, but after a while it comes out that we think we do. Um, 
Uh, well, I think I think one more question, and then we can go over to maybe questions from, from the audience or, or questions have been sent in. And the, there's a big uh, big general question: is uh, what do you think from Rick will be primarily be remembered for as a philosopher? Well, you know, that's a hard question. As I I talked about it in this in, in the book, and uh, I mean there are. But one thing we don't, I mean, it's very hard to make these predictions. I was just thinking, you know, there were two other philosophers of great note who died just about the same time, namely Davidson and Quine. And uh, I've just come back from Berkeley, and it, where it's clear that these now are thought of as outmoded, old-fashioned philosophers, and nobody wants to, no graduate student wants to read Davidson or Quine anymore. And, and the same is true of von Richt, I think. Uh, there will be a renaissance, but it might take uh, 20, 30, 40 years before people begin but by the way, to pay attention. Think about Anscombe, who died at the same time as Quine, do you think she would be? No, no, Anscombe died earlier. Right? About she? the same time as Quine, actually. Well, there's a certain kind of revival of her. Yeah. Although, I mean, if one can say in a certain sense, her, she, when she sees teaching, she turned to other things. So it's been... Probably 30 years since the, her work became was a real factor. So hers is, I think, now becoming revived again. Um, and it's also difficult because with Van Rick, it's very difficult to uh, separate his person from his work. And after his death, that has to be has to be done. And it's it's also true that he wrote on an enormous number of different topics. And so there's no one particular topic that one associates with him, as is often the case with, with uh, other uh, philosophers. And it's moreover, it's difficult stuff. I mean, his, his, to read him, I think, is more like reading Wittgenstein than reading people who, who give it to you straight out. I mean, you, you learn, in, in reading him, you don't try to find out what his claims were. You, you, you try to find out how to clarify your own claims and so on. And, yeah. and how whether people are willing to take the effort to do that, it's not clear. But it does seem to me that some of his later works, I mean, perhaps Varieties of Goodness, perhaps uh, Explanation and Understanding, and perhaps The Shadow of Descartes are, are works that will be read in some sense or another. Uh, so thing. that he will be remembered uh, in a hundred years. It's curious about the, in the shadow of Descartes because he he was working on these themes for quite a while, but he didn't really plan to publish it. Do, 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 do have any well, idea he, why? Well, in the preface, he mentions that you know he, the mind-body problem was what got him into the philosophy when he was 16 or something like that, yeah. and he said he really never ever wrote or thought seriously about those topics until a, a, a just a few years before Shadow of Descartes, so that. He'd been thinking about these things perhaps uh, maybe six, ten years or something like that. So there wasn't such a long gap. Mm -hmm. I think it's also true that none of those works are really, well, some are, but for the most part, they're, they're probing, hence the title of this book. I mean, they're unfinished. They, uh, they're extraordinarily deep reflections. For example, on sound, which is interesting because he suffered from deafness at the end of, of his life, and that was a kind of personal interest in sound. And sound is itself, uh, most people talk about vision, but sound raises other kinds of difficult problems. Mm -hmm. So it's an unfinished, probing uh, piece of work, not a, not a treatise of the sort that you would sort of think about publishing right off the bat. I think it's time for questions from the audience, and we already have one here. A question from, from Amir Hirschberg Berg in uh, Tel, Aviv, uh, Tel Aviv University. Can I take it? Sorry. Yeah. He says, I'm very, very interested in, in from, from Rick's work on the connection between knowledge and action. 
in practical inference. I hope you hear some comments uh, on von Wrick's complex view of the kind of necessity of the connection held in a subjective practical inference between the premises and conclusion. And to elaborate my question further, <coughs> von Wrick claims that it's logical necessity. However, he mentions some unlogical peculiarities of the inference. He also, also points to some sort of metaphysical necessity as if describing a necessary part of human rational behavior compelling us to act in a certain way. Uh, however, the necessity proved in on practical inference is more of a linguistic kind. From Richt shows that it's impossible to say that someone wants to attain the goal if it doesn't do the necessary act. So, to take that. <laughs> Well, that's a, I mean, it's a, that's a very difficult issue, and, and he wrote, Henrik wrote at least several times on uh, on this topic. And uh, there's also a, an article by Elizabeth Anscombe, which is a critique. And if one takes all of this together, one has an, a body of extremely interesting and uh, deep and difficult sort of work. I think in the end, what what he's, if I understand what he's saying, that's what Henrik came to that uh, if you say I intend to uh, go to the meeting and I think that in order to go to the meeting I have to get up early, it follows with necessity that you, that wh whatever you do, it will be your getting up early. Um, and if, if it's not that, then it follows that either you really didn't intend to go to the meeting or you didn't think that you had to get up early. Um, so, so that what he says is involved is really the practical inference sets conditions on what it is for an action to count as intentional action. Now, Anscombe criticizes him because she thinks practical inference should not include things like uh, psychological claims, like I intend or I think. It, it's, it, the, the, the practical inference should simply be, uh, I, will go to the, I will go to the meeting. In order to go to the meeting, I must get up early. Therefore, I will get up early. Um, and, and I think in a sense, and Fondrick has... In a sense, von Richt, I think, agrees with the thrust of, of her claim. Uh, and I guess I better not get into the thing. But uh, so it's an it's an interesting and difficult topic. But I think what what he says is in the end what von Richt came to. He changed mm -hmm. his mind yeah. at least twice about how to deal with this issue. I guess you could say that. I mean, there, there is. The way I read from Rick, there is a kind of internal relation or a, or a conceptual relation between exactly. intention and action, uh, but uh, that that doesn't have to mean that there's a that there's a, an entailment relation. In other words, it doesn't it doesn't follow that if I don't uh, get up early, I don't have the intention. Rather, it means that uh, that uh, if I if somebody claims that I have the uh, that the person has this intention. Uh, uh, and that the, the person knows he has to do something to realize the intention, then then the person who makes that claim has the burden of proof to explain why he doesn't do it. So, but there are things that can can come in between. I mean, there are, I mean, <coughs> logical connections aren't always watertight in this way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I thought I certainly wouldn't accept any talk about metaphysical necessity. That no, was, no, that was not his. Uh, Thing. Uh, no, I would agree with that. <laughs> I, I have a question. Uh, would you want to say something about these two collections? Why did you? Why why are these texts included? Okay, what do you want to say? About the book. Yeah. You mean you mean you about this book? Oh, well, the book originated in the conference in this very room uh, three years ago, I think. Yeah. And um, all of the contributions here were based on, sometimes somewhat loosely, based on papers that were given here. 
And um, not all of them. What? Not all. But, but not all the papers. Yeah. Some of the papers seem to us. Not, um, well, some of them just weren't on Fun Rick. Um, so we we chose what we thought were the best papers that dealt specifically with his work. And and I was pleased to see that we had, I think, some some good papers. And then we chose uh, one comment. Martina Reuter had a comment. Um, some of the comments were on papers that weren't about von Richt and, and so on. So it was a matter of trying to choose and put together uh, w w uh, what turned out to be a relatively coherent discussion chronologically. Now the second half was was Christian Segeberg's idea to um, make the book a little bit more uh, expansive, namely to take von Richt's a paper uh, that he gave at Uppsala on logic and philosophy in the 20th century, which um, was, was an extremely controversial paper, evidently. I, I didn't know about the controversy, but most analytical philosophers thought it was a kind of a traitor. He was a traitor to the cause. And uh, so we collected this random set of people who might respond. And it turned out, I think, that they were all critical, uh, but from, from different uh, points of view. I mean, I mean, Tim Williamson, for example, thinks that second-order logic is an important sort of thing. But he's he's doing metaphysics precisely of the sort of thing that uh, von Rick didn't think we should do. So it just represents an entirely different approach to uh, philosophy. Where now, Stern Stanley's paper is one of the more interesting ones because. He criticizes von Rick not so much because he thinks that von Rick is wrong about the future of philosophy, but because he thinks von Rick is wrong about the history of logic as he's given it in his paper. And this is a kind of minority view, but it's an interesting uh, notion. Um, so that's how the book has developed. Thank you. Yeah. And your comment about the about the part of collection? Yes, sir. Well, what I was trying to do was to, to give a broad overview of, of von Rick's different interests. And so there are, uh, at the same time, to bring out highlights. So, so there will be uh, some of these almost classical essays about murder logic, for instance, and, and uh, articles about, about tense logic, and the logical confirmation, on, um, and, uh, and, uh, also about about the heterological paradox, which is a very interesting paper, and I think very well known. But then, on the other hand, also uh, uh, articles written for for a wider audience, and they are mainly done in Swedish. And there are, for instance, uh, a series of articles about Dostoevsky's work, and uh, later on there will be about Tolstoy. And Spengler and so on, and uh, uh, um, and also uh, of these uh, more recent articles criticizing the contemporary world. So I think that's a, those are the kinds of themes. 